They rule London's East End during the turbulent 60s. They own nightclubs, businesses, and they rub shoulders with the mover and shakers of their day. How did they do it? They used an age-old motivational method to get ahead in life. Violence and intimidation. Case number 19. The Cray Twins. Mobsters. Today on the Noir Factory. Noir, suspense, true crime, hard-boiled fiction. Explore the dark alleys and cheap gin joints of mob history, noir films, hard-boiled paperbacks, and two-fisted pulp fiction with mystery writer and make-believe detective Stephen Gomez. Grab your fedora and button your lip as you enter the office of the internet's finest fictional detective agency, the Noir Factory. They were the best years of our lives. They called them the swinging 60s. The Beatles were rulers of pop music. Carnaby Street ruled the fashion world. And me and my brother ruled London. We were fucking untouchable. Ronnie Cray, from his autobiography. The East End of London during the 60s was a mixture of poor and artistic, modern and bohemian, of classic and diversity that England had never seen before or since. It was like Bauhaus before Hitler. It was like Harlem in the 20s. It was like, well, it wasn't like anything ever, and that's what made it special. Clubs and art galleries sprang up amid the squalor that was the East End, and with them came the rich and the beautiful. It was said, rather famously, that London's West End had all the money and leisure, and that the East End monopolizes most of the labor and nearly all of the dirt. In the 60s, it was time for the dirt in the East End to shine. The wealthy and the influential came to the East End to rub shoulders with the infamous, the dangerous, and the notorious. There was no neighborhood in all of England that encapsulated the 60s like the East End, and through it all lurked a dark and dangerous thread that led to a pair of twin brothers looking to make London their own. Ronald and Reginald Cray were born on October 24, 1933, within 10 minutes of each other. Their parents were Violet and Charlie a working-class couple in East England. The couple had another boy, Charlie Jr., who was already six years old when his twin brothers were born. Their parents also gave birth to a girl, Viola, who died when she was an infant. When the twins were still infants and World War II broke out, their father, Charlie Sr., went into a hiding to avoid the service. Charlie Sr. was absent most of the children's lives preferring to make his living by buying and selling gold, silver, and old clothes. When the twins were three, they both suffered from diphtheria. Both were hospitalized, but Reggie quickly recovered and was sent home. Ronnie, however, nearly died, and that episode cemented their mother's belief that it was the twins' best interest if they never separated. It was a belief the twins grew to hold as well. As they grew, they saw less and less of their father. While he would send money home and stop by from time to time, the police had more of a presence in the Cray home on Bethnal Green. World War II was in full swing, and Charlie Sr. was a deserter. The constabulary would often drop by, usually unannounced, and sometimes in the middle of the night, checking for the fugitive. On more than one occasion, Charlie was actually there and hid from authorities. Still, the arrival of the police turned the household inside out. And if the experience taught the Cray twins one thing, it was that the police were not to be trusted. The boys were natural scrappers, coming from a long line of boxers. In fact, when the twins were only nine, Ronnie almost died from a head injury sustained while brawling with Reggie. The Cray boys all looked up to their maternal grandfather, Jimmy Cannonball Lee, a professional bare knuckles fighter and all around hard guy. Jimmy lived across the street from the boys and raised them on fight stories and tough guy feats from his past. Cannonball made money taking bar bets. He would walk on nails, take a punch in the gut, and bare knuckles fight behind a bar. He was a much larger presence in the boy's life than their father, and his stories, like the man himself, made an impact. During the war, the East End was hit hard, 
and families were relocated to a small village outside of Suffolk. They spent a year there, and they came to love the small town, but their fortune soon brought them back to the East End. Perhaps it was her grandfather's stories, perhaps it was their natural inclination, but all three of the Cray boys, Charlie, Ronnie, and Reggie, soon took up boxing. For Charlie, who had always been a natural athlete, his father's absence had forced him to assume the mantle of man of the house. He worked at Lloyd's of London as a messenger five and a half days a week while he was still in school age, but any free time he had was spent at the gym, studying the sweet science. He joined the Navy when he was of age, and he fought as a welterweight. The twins seemed to catch the boxing bug as well. On their father's rare home visits, he would take the boys to Robert Browning Youth Club in South London for boxing lessons. As the twins grew, they remained energetic, curious, and impulsive, but their return to East End from Suffolk seemed to be a difficult period for them. The bombings of London didn't seem to bother the boys, and after the war, like so many other kids in the East End, their playgrounds were bomb craters, and their keepsakes were shrapnel. Following Charlie's example, the twins continued to box. In 1948, Reggie won the schoolboy championship in Hackney, and went on to win the schoolboy championship in London, and was a finalist in the Great Britain Schoolboys Championship. Ronnie, Reggie's usual sparring partner, was almost equally skilled, having won several schoolboy titles as well. But the Cray twins seemed to find the biggest reward fighting each other in the ring. They were at their most vicious when the two squared off, and they later said that their fighting helped each other become better, more driven fighters. It was said that neither boy lost a fight before turning professional at age 19. And outside the ring, the twins could be brutal as well. They formed a gang in the East End, and they relished dealing beatings as a form of intimidation and extortion. Around the same time the Cray twins were called up to mandatory national service in Britain. Like their father, the service didn't sit well for the boys, and they left after only a few minutes. It's reported that when a corporal attempted to stop the twins from leaving, Ronnie punched him in the jaw. The two young men then walked back to the East End. They were found easily enough by police, although they added an additional charge of assaulting the police officer when they were picked up. The Crays were sent to a military prison for desertion after a brief stay at the famous Tower of London, where they were one of the last prisoners held there. In prison, they were vicious, continuously assaulting guards, throwing hot tea in their jailers' faces, and emptying latrine buckets over the heads of guards. The Cray twins were dishonorably discharged when they were released, spelling an end to their boxing career. But that seemed just fine with them. It served to bolster their reputation as hard men, which they particularly enjoyed. Hi, Steve Gomez here. One of the mandates of the Noir Factory our mission statement, if you will, is to bring you new episodes of true crime history, noir analysis, and artist profiles regularly to a computer, iPad, or smartphone near you. In addition to that, we've also kept the home fires burning on our website, our Facebook page, as well as on Twitter and Instagram. If you haven't checked those out, I urge you to do so. And in addition to those familiar avenues, we have new and exciting things coming into our future. Although it's way too early to mention them, we're currently hard at work on making plans for and putting the finishing touches on. And you can keep up on everything we do by visiting the noirfactory.com and signing up for our mailing list. About once a month, we'll shoot you the skinny on and make sure you get a shot at. And we'll never spam you or share your email address with a rival mob. And you can take that to the bank, where my name isn't. And now we return you to this week's crime, already in progress. The Cray twins borrowed money from their brother Charlie and purchased a billiard parlor in East End neighborhood of Bethnal Green. The parlor served as a base of operations for the gang, who had begun to widen the scope of their crimes. Calling their gang The Firm, Ronnie became the organizational force behind the gang. They expanded their activities from protection rackets to armed robbery, hijacking, and arson. Ronnie also saw the Crays as criminal kingpins 
and he instructed his gang members to extort money from small-time criminals who had the gall to operate in East End. For maybe the first time in the Cray's life, a rift was occurring. Reggie preferred to keep a low profile and grow their business interests. Ronnie was openly gay in 1950s London, and he dared anyone in the world to say a negative word about it to his face. No one did. He enjoyed the gangster lifestyle. He wore flashy clothes and spent money liberally. The firm took over more and more action in the East End, becoming a force in the London underworld. Ronnie loved the attention and planned each job with precision and detail, earning him the nickname The Colonel. Ronnie also developed an obsession with firearms. In 1956, during a protection racket job, Ronnie shot a car dealer in the leg. Reggie was enraged at his brother for such rash action. It was England in the 50s and gun crimes were a rarity, and Reggie considered the shooting a risk they didn't need to take. Ronnie was arrested for the shooting, but he managed to escape prosecution by pretending to be his brother who had a rock solid alibi. Ronnie, now more than ever, felt the two were invincible. Due to their violent reputation, there wasn't a soul on the East End who could swear at a complaint, and not a cop in England, Ronnie felt, that could lay a finger on them. Shortly afterwards, however, Ronnie was convicted on an unrelated assault, committed earlier by he and Reggie, and he was sentenced to three years in jail. In prison, Ronnie was still issuing orders to the firm, but it was Reggie who now held the reins of the game, and he had a different vision for the firm. Focusing on more legitimate business, Reggie took over a club in the West End. The club, Esmeralda's Barn, took off when Reggie turned it into a gambling hall, and it became the crown jewel of their business empire. In prison, Ronnie was transferred to a facility on the Isle of Wight, and his control over the firm lessened. Reggie, on the other hand, continued to invest as well as extort his way into nightclubs all over London. The firm was seeing wild success. In prison, Ronnie's health began to suffer greatly, and cracks began to appear on his hard guy facade. He was greatly affected by the passing of his Aunt Rose, and he was starting to show greater emotional instability. In a prison hospital, Ronnie Cray was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and he was transported to the mainland for care in a secure mental facility. He was released in April of 1959, but incarceration had taken its toll, and Reggie continued to guide the firm while Ronnie recuperated. Over the next few months, the business end of the Cray Empire continued to grow, and while Ronnie was gathering his strength, he became a believer in his brother's vision. The West End Club was a hit, and the Crays, known as mobsters and criminals, were a huge draw for the club. The Cray twins were becoming known outside of the East End, and the mix of danger with a break from routine called to England's young stars. Joan Collins was seen at Cray nightclubs, as were the artists Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon. Towards the end of 1959, it was Reggie's turn at incarceration. He served 18 months for extortion, and while Ronnie had recuperated his strength, he still wasn't very stable. The twins made their older brother Charlie the financial manager of the West End Club, keeping business in the family, as well as keeping an eye on Ronnie. Ronnie took back the reins of the firm and relished in the role of the gay playboy gangster. He used the Cray nightclubs as a personal vice den and he opened lines of credit for friends and canceled them on a whim. Ronnie couldn't get enough of the notoriety and it seemed as if the attention to detail and the regimented lifestyles that led others to call him the Colonel was now long gone. In 1964, the Daily Mirror printed headlines that had photographic evidence of a well-known member of the House of Lords having a sexual relationship with a known gangster. Six days after that, a German magazine named the individuals as Lord Boothby and Ronnie Cray. Boothby sued the Mirror, who in turn published a retraction, fired their editor, and paid out a $40,000 pound settlement to Boothby. When Ronnie Cray attempted to sue the Mirror, he received none of these things, but the message to London newspapers seemed clear. Be very careful what you printed about the Crays. With the release of Reggie, the Cray Empire seemed to be back at full strength. 
but in reality, the gang was pulling apart. On March 9, 1966, a member of the Richardson gang, rivals of the firm, was having drinks at the Blind Beggar Pub in Whitechapel. The Richardson gang had killed a member of the firm in a shootout weeks earlier. While nearly all the members of the Richardson gang had been sent to prison, George Cornell had the good luck to be out of town. On this day, however, he also had the bad luck to be having drinks at the Blind Beggar. Ronnie Cray was also having drinks at another pub when he learned of Cornell's location. Hurrying to the Blind Beggar, Ronnie walked up to George Cornell as he sat on his stool enjoying a beer. Cornell looked up over his glass at Ronnie Cray and said, Well, look who's here. Ronnie Cray then shot George Cornell in the head. The pub erupted into panic, and a Cray associate fired five shots in the air, cowering the crowd and sending a message to anyone who might dare talk to the police. At the pub, another Richardson gang member, George Dixon, was held at gunpoint by Ronnie Cray, but he was allowed to live. When police investigated later, they found no witnesses willing to testify. But despite that, Scotland Yard was already on the case. Around the time of the Boothby affair, the Yard had appointed a young detective, Chief Inspector Leonard Reed, to head a dedicated task force to investigate the activities of the Crays and their firm. Reed, also known as Nipper, ran up against the ruthless and brutal reputation of the Crays, and despite repeatedly hauling in the twins, he was unable to make anything stick. In 1967, it was said that the Crays assisted in the escape of Frank the Mad Axeman Mitchell. Mitchell had befriended Ronnie in prison, and Ronnie felt that he was unfairly incarcerated. The Crays stashed Mitchell in a friend's apartment and helped hide him from the police. Mitchell was a large man who suffered from a mental disorder, and surprisingly, the man nicknamed the Mad Axeman proved difficult to control. He quietly disappeared and his body was never found. The Crays were later tried and acquitted of his murder. With things closing in on the Crays, the twins, particularly Ronnie, grew suspicious of his crew. In 1967, they were convinced that an associate of the firm, Leslie Payne, was going to turn evidence against them in return for clemency on charges from Scotland Yard. The Crays brought in Jack the Hat McVitie to silence Payne before he could talk. McVitie failed in his attempt on Payne's life, and when the Crays asked for their money back, he foolishly refused. The Crays lured McVitie into an apartment flat in Stoke Newington, under the pretense that all was forgiven and they were going to celebrate. As soon as McVitie entered the room, Ronnie shouted abuse and cut the man with a broken glass. During the fight, Reggie pulled a handgun and fired at McVitie's head twice. Both times a gun jammed. As members of the firm held McVitie, Reggie stabbed him repeatedly in the face and chest with a carving knife. Charlie Cray was tasked with disposing of the body, which he performed quite admirably since McVitie was never found. For the murder of Jack McVitie, the Cray twins were acquitted, but Charlie Cray ended up serving a 10-year sentence as an accessory to murder. Leslie Payne was made aware of the attempt on his life, as well as the fate of his assassin. Weighing his options, he felt that informing allowed him the greatest chance for survival. He met with Scotland Yard, and he told him everything he knew about the Crays, to the tune of 200 pages worth of report. On May 9, 1968, just as dawn broke, the Cray twins were arrested at their parents' home. While all over London, 20 members of the firm were simultaneously taken into custody. With the Crays and their gang in a holding cell, neighborhood folk for the first time felt secure enough to talk to the police about the Crays. During the trial, a parade of witnesses and informants offered up evidence against the Crays. Despite the mountain of evidence that was produced against them, the Crays were convicted only on the rather public murder of George Cornell. For their crime, the twins, Ronnie and Reggie, were sentenced to life in prison. In England at the time, this meant a sentence of around 10 to 12 years. In the case of the Crays, however, the judge stipulated that their sentence would be no less than 30 years. The brothers were incarcerated at separate facilities, but after a plea from their mother was heard, they were reunited at Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight. Shortly afterwards, however, 
Ronnie's mental state began to deteriorate, and he was transferred again to Broadmoor. While he was there, Ronnie, a well-known homosexual, married twice, first to Elaine Mildener in 1985, who he divorced in 89, and then to Kate Howard, who he divorced in 94. Reggie also married in prison in 1997 to Roberta Jones. While in prison, there was a remarkable public outcry for the craze release, and a petition with over 10,000 signatures was sent to Downing Street. There were many who saw the Cray twins as Robin Hood types, although there was never any evidence to show that they actually did any good for anyone. The Crays were also seen as East End boys who got the short end of the stick from the government. Their fans, for lack of a better word, saw their sentence as unfair. In this case, there's a point to be made that at the time, it was the harshest sentence ever handed down by English courts, almost double what murders under similar circumstances received. Having said that, there was no shortage of examples of the brutality of the twins, just as there's no way to underestimate the effect they had on the East End. Ronnie Cray died in Broadsmoor Prison in the hospital wing of a heart attack in 1995. Reggie was temporarily released from prison to attend his twin's funeral, which was attended by thousands of onlookers. Reggie Cray served 33 years in prison and was released on compassionate grounds in 2000 after he was diagnosed with inoperable bladder cancer. He passed away on October 1st of that year. As his funeral procession passed through the East End, it was said that as many as 100,000 people lined the route. Both men are buried next to each other in Chingford Cemetery in London, as per their wishes. That closes the books on this case. Join us next time on the wrong side of the tracks at the Noir Factory, as we look at the best in true crime, noir, and hard-boiled stories has to offer. If you've enjoyed this podcast, then please subscribe on iTunes and leave an honest review. And be sure to stop by the website to fill up on pulpy and hard-boiled goodness. And remember, nice guys finish last. Still there? This week's special Noir Factory Dakota message is coming right up. Crack the code by visiting the noirfactory.com backslash key. Three, twenty-three, six, twenty, three, two, twelve. That is all. For the key to this code, go to the noirfactory.com forward slash key. Good night.